first person was Michael, who's going to talk about, who's going to talk about um, science and sharing. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Nielsen. Um, what I'm going to do to start this off just for a few minutes is talk about um, sort of some of the broader cultural issues as an introduction to uh, uh, Garrett, I guess, uh, a little bit more concretely, uh, uh, Victoria and, and Cameron. Um, I want to talk about what, what I call a problem, which uh, I think most of you are familiar with, that the basic problem is this. Scientists are very reluctant uh, to make scientific contributions using modern media because there are few or, or no incentives to do so. Um, you know, that's sort of a one-sentence summary of, of, of a massive problem that, that many of you in, in this room are based in, in building tools, um, and that those of you who are working with scientists, there, there, are, there are few incentives to contribute in many ways. My two favorite examples of this problem um, in action, uh, probably my favorite example is in fact Wikipedia. Um, you know, Wikipedia's mission statement is, is, is to take all the world's information uh, and make it universally uh, accessible. Um, you, you, you think that, that this was something that was perhaps started by, by, by scientists or at the very least by academics. It sounds uh, very similar to you know, the way we sort of think about uh, the mission of, of universities. Uh, but of course it was it was not. In fact, it's a very interesting thing. If you go back and look at the early days uh, of Wikipedia, a lot of the people contributing were people who were ex-academics, um, or you know they were students or whatnot. But there were very few academics themselves. And of course, the, the reason is, is very simple. Uh, you know, you, you can't put that on your CV. It doesn't matter for, for hiring committees uh, and so on and so forth. You can't you can't get any credit for it. The second example. Um, which I also like is, is blogs. You can write a, a beautifully detailed uh, blog post that contains many important scientific ideas. Uh, it doesn't matter at all if you want your career as a scientist. However, if you uh, uh, were to put the same uh, sort of basic item up on a, uh, you know, you were to submit it to a journal with some, some reformatting, uh, you get a lot of credit for it. So, I mean, this is, this is an insane you know, kind of a system. Now, it's tempting to think that this is all new. In fact, exactly the same set of issues has been faced and overcome in the past. Um, in particular, uh, in the 17th century, when science was just getting started, uh, when modern science was just getting started, in fact, we, we basically have the same problem. If you look at a lot of the early scientists, they tended to be very secretive with their discoveries. My favorite example of this is Robert Hooke, the, the, the early physicist, publishing Hooke's Law, the thing that, that everybody's taught in high school, he published it as an anagram. The reason he published it as, a, as an anagram uh, is because he wanted to be able to continue to work uh, on this discovery and, and make further, sort of build on it a, a, a bit further while hiding it from other people who might potentially have an interest. Uh, but if somebody else discovered it later, he could reveal the anagram and say, I got it first. <laughs> right? Now, now it'd be great to say Hook was the only guy to do this, but in fact, there were loads of people. People like Galileo used anagrams, Huygens uh, used anagrams, and so and, and, and what shifted, what shifted, um, you know, at, at that early time there were few incentives to share. What shifted was that governments and other wealthy patrons, because of the success of science, started to um, uh, subsidise scientists as a whole. And they subsidised it in a very important way. They did not subsidise discovery so much as they subsidised the sharing of discovery. Right? You are judged based on your, your, your research track record, the, the list of publications in your curriculum detail. Uh, as, as, as a scientist. So by subsidising the sharing of discovery in that way, we were able to create this culture of, 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 of sharing. Unfortunately, that subsidy, which caused that shift 300 years ago, is now getting in the way. Right? It's now inhibiting the adoption of other media. So, I mean, because, because we are still being subsidised to share our discoveries in, 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 in you know, nature and, 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 and whatnot, in, Journals, uh, we're actually sort of anti incentivized to share our discoveries uh, using more uh, modern media. An example, uh, an analogy I like uh, is to the corn based ethanol uh, subsidies in the United States. Um, in the early days, a lot of people thought this was a good idea, at least in principle. Now we realize that corn based ethanol is not such a good idea, but that, that's much clearer now than it was then. And in fact, these subsidies are, are now they're, they're a big problem uh, because they remain in place and they're preventing the adoption of other technologies. It's a, it's a very kind of similar, uh, similar situation. Um, now, of course, what's going on, if you look five or ten years ago, the sort of the, the new media, the social media, uh, wikis and whatnot, 
um, were not so well uh, developed. And so there was only a little bit of pressure on scientists to change. As those tools get better and better, of course, more and more pressure is being brought to bear. What I think is, is likely to happen is that in the next sort of five uh, to 10 years, um, you know, as the tools get, get better and better and better, there will, there will be more and more pressure uh, uh, brought to bear on scientists uh, uh, to shift. But the way individual scientists often feel uh, is certainly that there's little they can do. You know, how, how are they supposed to change the scientific system uh, uh, as, as a whole if it doesn't feel like uh, there's a lot you can do uh, as an individual? But I think you know, as, as these, these tools outside of science get more and more successful, um, there's likely to be more and more pressure brought to bear uh, uh, from outside of science and also in particular um, from, from people like the government and, and people at the top of the grant agencies who start to realise that in fact there's a very good reason to shift the subsidy from conventional ways of publishing uh, into uh, new ways of publishing. And we recently saw a very big example of that, the National Institutes of Health, their um, uh, open access uh, mandate which came into place this year, which basically mandated that uh, you know, if, if, if you publish a paper which was subsidised in some way by the National Institutes of Health, there's a provision that, that means that six months after publication, it has to be made uh, open access. Particularly, there's a bunch of details there. But that's a, you know, it's, it's a it's a small but very significant shift uh, towards a more open culture, a more sharing culture in science. And you know, this opens it up for everybody in the world to, to access these papers. Um, so I think that's really all I wanted to say. Can you clarify, yep. is it the paper that's open access or is it the data that's open access? Oh, so in that particular case, at the moment, it is just the paper that is open access. Of course, there are many people who like the data to be made open access, uh, but it's a good first step to have the paper. What does that mean? Sorry? But if, if you're sitting at home in uh, you know, sort of Tucson, Arizona, and uh, you don't have your university access, you don't have a subscription. I got it, I got it, I got it. Or you were working at the government. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Or you're sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> or you're sitting here. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's a great thing. But I hope you want to go further than you just have to open paper. I think the okay. publisher is hopelessly old fashioned to publish current junk. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that point. Yeah. Okay. We'll yeah. So, in fact, actually, we'll come back to that point right at the moment. And Gary is going to talk about an example where. Could, could I, could I add something though? Because. There's another way that this story about Pope and Newton and what happened was told. It's a much more traditional media view of this, which is Henry Oldenburg <coughs> starting the Philosophical Transactions, the first scientific journal, and saying that the role of the journals is going to be, you give us your stuff and you openly disclose it, and in return, the community is going to give you recognition of the community peer review and what have you. And a huge fan of open access, blah, 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 but this system actually works pretty effectively when it's applied the way it was supposed to be applied, which is that the, you actually have to disclose, it is a principle of scientific publishing, that you disclose your main result. That's why the community is giving you credit. Sure. So there's a way of looking at, at this that says the publication system per se, the way it's set up as a reward system is fine, but what's broken is you can no longer disclose your main result in the text of a paper because the results are not, have become much larger. So there needs to be ways of accessing stuff that's not part of the paper, but a sort of six-page paper that is as open as that stuff on, on, yeah. on the paper. Yeah, I, I just rephrase that so everybody can hear it, if anybody didn't. Yeah, I'm going to keep <coughs> um, I think the, the, the basic summary there is uh, 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 you know, that that papers are all well and good, but there are other types of, of, of results. For example, maybe the human, human genome, that would be an example, mm -hmm. um, where you, know, you, you can't publish that in a paper, and, and you know, there needs to be uh, you know, new forms of publication, which we assume that, of course, I agree, we are going to talk about exactly this. So it's sort of an augmentation of the traditional publication mechanism, because the reward structure is already built, and sort of reinforcing it rather than uh, trying to break it down. The way I like the, the, the sort of this is that copyright is about the same thing. Copyright is actually about making stuff available. The British Library, the Library of Congress, were the World Wide Web of the time. That was how you made stuff available to people, by putting it in a central location where people find it. We just need to do it for everything. Just. <laughs> in particular, I mean, for scientific conversation, you know, the, the, the fact is that at the moment you have your conversations with a few trusted collaborators, 
but very often they're not the right people uh, to be having the conversation with. The, 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 critical, the, the critical resource in science is, is expert attention in some sense. I mean, in any form of creativity, it's expert attention. That's what scares, that's what we don't have enough, enough of, and, and you want to match people with complementary expertise uh, you know, as rapidly as possible. 